good morning, uh, good afternoon to all participants and uh, panelists. Uh, first, I would like to apologize for moving uh, this webinar 24 hours. I had some uh, scary moments uh, pre before Halloween yesterday with my computer, and I apologize for that. We are now back on track. Uh, Tom Chatham was uh, nice to reschedule immediately, and I want to welcome uh, Tom Chatham from now in Mexico, but you know Tom is uh, from San Francisco originally. Uh, good morning, uh, Tom. Thank you for waking up again early. <laughs> good morning. Yes. And we have uh, Dushan Simic, uh, my colleague and uh, co-author of the book uh, in New York. Good morning to everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. And uh, so we will not say good night to our friends and colleagues from Australia and New Zealand, just to stay with us. Welcome, everybody. Yes. Uh, some of you uh, attended my previous webinars, and some of you attended my, our last webinar. It was uh, October 15 with uh, Malai Hirani, uh, co author of our book. And I'm very, very happy, very proud that this book is out. It's printed uh, in limited edition in Vancouver just around first webinar. And now it's printed in a few thousand copies in uh, Canada, US border for. Uh, many orders around the world. I'm very proud to say that we have uh, 550 uh, bulk orders and uh, over 100 individual orders from uh, 19 countries, four continents. So it is really impressive. And of course, uh, Midushan, uh, were main uh, initiator and very brave to do this book in these difficult times, but uh, we feel it's good time. Uh, and we would like to thank, of course, uh, first our co-authors, uh, Dr. Boris Fegleson from Nama Research Laboratory, uh, lab researcher Sherry Woodring, our original uh, first and second book uh, co uh, first book co-author. Dush will tell more about this later. Uh, CVD engineer Malai Hirani from India, from Sony CVD Diamonds, and uh, engineer uh, Frank Ripka from Algodanza. He's our next uh, uh, webinar uh, host. Uh, guest uh, October, sorry, November 6. Uh, this book is reviewed by Antonat Metlens, uh, author and educator, probably you know, know her very well, from USA, Richard Drucker, sorry, one K is missing, and Stuart Robertson from Gem Guide magazine, and our friend, colleague, and uh, researcher Alberto Scarani, gemologist from Agile Labs Italy. And of course, we couldn't do it without uh, people like Tom Chatham, people like Nile Shesh from Nice Diamond, uh, who are giving us samples, who are giving us stones for certification, to study, to do research. Uh, without this kind of good people in our industry, this book would not exist. And of course, we want to thank Godwin and Mumtaz Gonzalez, our editor from previous edition and this edition. They create really nice combination of old and new information, a nice design. Hopefully you will like it. Some of you already uh, emailed me or text me on Facebook, uh, uh, message me that you like the book. and. Uh, it was uh, good uh, uh, to read. And of course, I want to uh, also mention our colleague, uh, countryman Nesha Popovich, who is a uh, manager of uh, Metrean and German Jewelry Conference, who really uh, collecting all this information about webinars, books, orders, and really it's our, it's our right hand in this case. Again, uh, without uh, major sponsors like uh, NCJV Australia, uh, my big supporter in education and workshops, and uh, NAJ USA, we would not even start this book. We got this uh, a commitment from them ordering many hundreds of books in July, August. Uh, same with, uh, I want to thank uh, Gail Levine and Kim Hughes, of course, uh, Shirley Mitchell, she's with us uh, today, who ordered many uh, books for UK. Uh, there are distributors in UK and Australia, NCJV Australia and GVA in UK. And you can see on the bottom of the screen this uh, uh, direct link you can order from them if you are from Australia and UK. It's much faster, much easier for shipping, and hopefully you will do this. So now I would like to give uh, for a few minutes uh, microphone uh, to Dushan Simic, uh, my longtime friend and uh, and colleague and researchers. We met uh, just a few days before my trip to US when I was studying GA in 1995, and actually the first time I heard about Tom Chatham was during the study in GA. Of course, as uh, about his father. Uh, and himself as a producer of uh, emeralds, rubies, and sapphires. And many years uh, after, I'm still with Ushan, we still uh, do different interesting projects, we still do articles and books. Uh, we just, uh, yesterday, IDEX published one article uh, from Dushan, and Dushan will tell you more about his journey from Europe to Africa and uh, 
Asia. Mr. Dushan. Thank you, Branko. Hello, everybody. And just uh, in a few words and pictures, you know, I'll say something about myself. And of course, uh, everything about the diamonds for me started in India under Pancharatna. You see the first picture. And uh, where I met, and unfortunately, I don't have a good picture from the uh, Indian famous gemologist uh, Jai Shri Panjikar and uh, Mr. Ramchandran, who is not any longer with us. Uh, and uh, after that train to Surat, uh, visiting uh, factories, and uh, also I met the uh, Indian Diamond Institute, you know. And uh, after that, it happened in the middle of the in the middle of the nineties, last century. And then Branko and me, I think it is ninety seven. We went. We went to ninety eight. We went together to Sri Lanka, travel all around all mines and the people, and uh, just to learn about this beautiful country. I moved to I moved to states in '99. I started to work uh, in '92 for EGL USA, and uh, mostly, mostly uh, our our work from the first day was concentrated on the. Of course, it is identification, but it was about synthetic diamonds. At the time, we used to call like this, you know. And then uh, this picture with a uh, with a yellow background is uh, from a conference in Bangkok, where we presented the the first uh, the first identified synthetic diamonds mounted in jewelry. In order to learn how to identify stones, uh, then I started to to learn how to how to create the problem. Mostly, it, I started this with experiments with the Suncrest, after that uh, by myself. And uh, there is, uh, there is uh, one interesting book, you know, that uh, was uh, published in uh, uh, 2012 or 13. I'm not sure, you know. But this is something what uh, uh, it is about identification of, of HPMC treated stones. And uh, no one wanted to, to publish this paper in the magazines, and then I published this uh, with the help for editing with Alexander Zaitsev. And uh, here is something what I'm uh, doing for the last nine years uh, with this gentleman with the, with the red helmet. This is uh, Jason Cohn, awarded uh, filmmaker. We are traveling, uh, we used to travel around the world because the movie is ready. It is documentary for 90 minutes for cinema. Showtime production, and uh, beside me, as a, like a main character, there is also uh, Stephen Lucier from uh, from his talking for the movie, uh, from uh, De Beers, uh, Martin Rappaport, uh, Techmas uh, Printer, and uh, unknown but very interesting people. The movie should be premiered uh, during uh, next year and it is postponed because of the situation with pandemic. And uh, last line, Branko and me working uh, different conferences. Uh, the middle one is from Cambridge. Uh, the right one is from uh, Warwick. And mostly we presented there our papers uh, about uh, synthetic diamonds. And, uh, okay, Branko, now you can, okay. yes, you uh, can continue. We, we presented, uh, I was just counting, uh, two, three uh, international trips of conferences or workshops per year in the last 15, 20 years. So you can imagine uh, how many conferences we've been. And this is uh, by invitation only, the biggest research conferences where basically we cannot even uh, publish these papers after we have to keep it confidential because it's, we discuss one, two days, just certain problems like what, what was in color of brown diamonds or how to change color. Anyway, so many of you, uh, I think most of you met me or knows me from the shows or workshops or my training on German jewelry conference. I co-found with George Spiromilus uh, from Greece. I'm also, uh, what I do every day, uh, four days a week is, uh, I'm a gemologist in the Canadian Gem Lab, where I, where I see the problems when I see the stones coming. And uh, lately, last uh, few months, uh, I see more and more laboratory-grown diamonds. And uh, 
Just yesterday, I had a visit from a local uh, retailer uh, who wanted to start certify with me, and he was surprised, and I was actually uh, not surprised, but when I look at uh, my lamination machine, what I'm laminating for the yesterday production, it was half-half of natural diamonds and lab-grown, and I was like a little bit surprised myself. It means they are coming really strongly. And the uh, last uh, five years, uh, me and Elena Deljani, we are very uh, active in genealogical research industry, Inc. Even our son has uh, become part of it. In what you know, uh, offering these webinars, uh, practical with the uh, with the samples, instruments, also uh, selling other books. Dushan and me have other books, and he has his books. I have my own uh, little books, and and uh, we do this. Uh, through Genealogical Research Industry, Inc., brancogems.com. And of course, uh, I was traveling to many places like Dushan, uh, doing field research on diamonds and gems. Uh, so it's enough about me. Uh, I think uh, you can find more information uh, if you want. So about the book. Uh, so it took us some time to plan and took us a lot of time to produce these articles. And I'll just go quickly through the content so you can see what is there for those who doesn't have it. So we repeat some information from 2007 edition, not because we want to brag about this, because we want to really, uh, this information is still valid, still correct. And on purpose, we put even pictures from uh, Chatham, you will see later, uh, First Stones, Colo Diamonds, and that time was AOTC and uh, Gemesis. Uh, both companies don't produce diamonds anymore. AOTC is still active in making uh, HPHT presses and selling presses now. And Apollo Diamond, as you know, also does not uh, produce uh, gem quality diamonds. They may be active in some other uh, part of the diamond industry. Then we basically repeat this chapter background because it's a very good chapter and they have a very good uh, background on diamond types, changing color of diamonds that me and Dushan uh, were big on HPHT uh, treatments and other irradiation, multi step process. Uh, then this is part two. We really mixed old information, new information because we invited uh, uh, Boris Ferguson to talk about diamond growth overview. Uh, you'll see more about him later, and Malai Harani about CVD diamonds overview. We also have uh, two additions. We talk about new producer uh, from 2020. Many of them uh, pop up, as you can imagine, last 13 years. Uh, what's interesting to mention that we contacted, and I have emails uh, really in Dushan, we spent like weeks and weeks trying to collect information from 100 plus companies. And guess what? We have 10 or 15 who replied, and Tom Chatham was not one of them, telling us what he's doing now, what is very positive, very open. Many of them did not want to disclose who they are, what they're doing. We know them, but they don't want to do it publicly uh, in a book. And we have also Frank Ripka talking about uh, Wimberley Diamonds, interesting uh, small part, but interesting part of uh, our industry. Of course, for us gemologists, the presence, and many of you are, and retailers, even in jewelers, identification is very important. And we dedicated over 60, 70 pages uh, in this chapter three, combining all the information, all pictures that are valid, and adding new chapters like uh, identification summary 2020 is different than 2007, of course. Uh, but we added uh, uh, Sherry Woodring uh, from GKL Laboratory, put nice pictures of inclusions of diamonds, even they're clean, sometimes they do have inclusions. Uh, Dushan and myself, we did uh, uh, two chapters of cross polarized filters, uh, update for new samples, and we want to thank Nilesh uh, uh, for giving us stones. And Tom Chatham also gave us some stones. And fluorescence as a screening tool. And the last uh, one is really something that most of you, uh, as end users, would do send a lab big, la big diamond to laboratory or get some information of grading of this diamond from local appraiser, or you do by yourself if you're appraiser. And we added very important article on tracking diamonds with the uh, patent, uh, the Dushan Simic patent uh, labeling integration system. And something that uh, people don't want to talk about it, but we always open a little bit uh, can of the new subject or difficult uh, topics like fraudulent replicas. People duplicating diamonds based on GA, other reports, major labs. And we have a nice uh, actual dictionary, a nice uh, references and a few ads from our sponsors and we have also a company from uh, russia ultra c uh, was supporting us uh, so this is what we did the last uh, two weeks ago and we had really around 20 questions uh, we answer all of them uh, from malai hirani and this uh, if you go to my website brancogems.com under practical webinars you can just click a recorded webinar uh, one, and you can listen it for free. 
this webinar is around one hour with Dushan, uh, myself, and Malai Hirani. And here it's not easy topic, it's more technical uh, from his side, but he tried to make it uh, as simple as possible. But in the book, there's a 15 pages of this uh, topic. So uh, from Malai Hirani. Next one, it will be uh, oh, November 6th, uh, quite early in uh, Europe because of change of time. I move it to half an hour uh, later just to address. It will be 7 o'clock in the morning in England, 8 in the rest of the Europe, uh, still 10 o'clock uh, in, in Moscow and Dubai, and uh, in Australia is much easier, uh, or uh, India, China, uh, they'll be in the afternoon. We stay here today, believe it or not, even people coming from India and China listening to us. So it is a really interesting uh, combination of attendees. Uh, in these webinars. And uh, we will basically, Frank will talk about what they're doing in Switzerland. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a moderator. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, their opinion. This is the webinar we will not record. So who wants to really listen about this topic, they have to come uh, and listen to this one. Just to warn you that it's not recorded, this one only out of these seven. Uh, webinar four, it's a really, really big pleasure to uh, have Boris Figelson. Uh, a pioneer and a big, big researcher who is now for um, uh, last maybe uh, 10 years or more in Washington, D.C., working for Naval Research Laboratory. Uh, at some point, I think uh, uh, Sherry Woodring visited them. Uh, we have some pictures from this laboratory. But he will talk about what he did in the 80s and 90s when he was a chief uh, uh, scientist in uh, uh, Novosibirsk, uh, Siberia producing lab-grown diamonds from, from bars presses and later on toroid presses. I was lucky to be there in 2000, visiting a few, uh, institu three institutes in Novosibirsk and Moscow. And 2015, I visited a new diamond technology company in Russia, in St. Petersburg. But of course, this is a HPHT focus on HPHT grown diamonds. From the east side story, I really recommend this one to come because you won't hear it again. It will be recorded, but you can ask questions directly to the one of the uh, legend uh, who was uh, even the Beers uh, was writing uh, and BBC uh, movies about him. He is really uh, famous. Uh, and uh, very, very big pleasure to have uh, Sherry Woodring uh, uh, back uh, as a uh, co-author of one article, Microworld, the HPC Grown and Studio Diamonds. Uh, her laboratory now that she works in GKL do a lot of certification for U.S. market. Uh, of course, IGI doing a lot and now GI starting and other labs. I'm doing it here for Canadian market. Uh, so basically, what we do we when we have this kind of planner or one plane clouds with the black uh, uh, little amorphous carbon, this is strong, strong indication the diamond is uh, CVD grown. Or we have this stop of the uh, growth, inter uh, in in interruption in growth. So, Sherry talk about this in her lecture. And of course, to talk about clarity, color, but also uh, what value as well. I ask you to do about value because of your presence are interested in that and you are uh, big supporters of these webinars. And uh, of course, with, uh, two pre-Christmas uh, uh, lecture, like today's a Halloween lecture, uh, happened to be. It will be uh, from Dushan Simic, uh, a very interesting lecture because it will be all identification, all research. Uh, Dushan uh, checked thousands of stones while working in New York uh, with me and uh, on his own last 10-15 uh, years in his own laboratory. Uh, analytical gemology and jewelry. And as you can see here, uh, sometimes people give big parcels and, and the, he has to separate uh, on the left synthetic, on the right natural, uh, with the cross polarized filters, not only fluorescence, other techniques, very fast screening uh, spectrometers. And Dushan will talk about his patent uh, and everything else uh, he thinks is interesting for you. And I will finish uh, this uh, uh, webinar seven uh, on the chapter on fluorescence and also certification and basically give you some overview of what uh, coming to laboratory here in Canada and uh, what instruments we use in the laboratory to screen that is infrared spectrometer, for example, or photoluminescence or visible and combine uh, my experience with the samples uh, that are on the market. So uh, again, it's big, big pleasure to have Chatham, uh, Tom Chatham back. Uh, he is working with us since uh, 2000, 2001, when we, we first certified, uh, actually, uh, Liberty Grand Diamonds in New York lab with the same grading system as natural. It was revolutionary. We, we, we got a lot of critics, uh, especially myself, from different uh, organizations at that time, big organizations, natural. 
I just uh, thought at that time that is uh, fair to grade it because the different qualities uh, and we <coughs> disclosed them. In the beginning, uh, I have to tell uh, Tom Chatham had a better pinks than any other producer uh, for many years. His pinks were more lighter pinks, more natural looking pinks. And I uh, really, uh, because they have, you know, why, but uh, maybe uh, Dushan can tell later. Uh, but then, of course, this is a switch. This is a, 16 years after we have another palette of different colors from different producers. This is Swarovski selling these uh, color diamonds and other producers. I'm sure Tom has also new colors. He can talk about this later. And now I will give actually microphone to Dushan to introduce properly Tom Chatham and uh, tell about him. And of course, then uh, Tom Chatham can take over and uh, you can ask him any questions. On the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A uh, button, uh, button, uh, button to press and you already have one question. So great. So you can ask this question and we will answer them towards the end of the uh, Tom's presentation. He will talk about one topic or, or, or or most about his company in the beginning, but then we can answer questions. It's like a round table. I like to be interactive. Dushan also, uh, not only us talking about the book, is Tom Chatham talking about his experience. So please ask questions and Tom, Dushan, please uh, continue. Thank you, Branko. And uh, really, uh, today we have a pleasure that our guest and panelist is a real symbol for synthetic gems and diamonds. It might be too ambitious to say that Chatham created gems uh, will last forever, but they really have been around for 86 years as inventors and family business. Let's see these years. In 1936, Carol Chatham, Tom's father, created first synthetic emerald. In 1958, they created synthetic ruby. In 1972, they created synthetic alexandrite. In 1996, I repeat, 1996, they created synthetic uh, uh, colorless diamond. In 2004, they created a melee er and brought to the market melee color diamonds. And somehow, uh, because the Tom Chatham was the only source for us to do our experiments and research. Uh, we have in our first edition, we have a, here Tom Diamonds. In our second edition, because 2007, we, yeah. 2007, yeah, second edition of Laboratory Grown Diamonds, uh, because uh, it was possible to find melee uh, fancy color diamonds. We develop uh, we develop a system for identification of mounted melee synthetic diamonds using uh, fluorescence. That is valid still, and so many companies and black boxes are using this method still today. And finally, in 2020, where else on the our cover page are Tom Stones? And my introductory question for Tom today is, we know, Tom, that uh, th these days, in the last few days, you are looking for something uh, really big and expensive, you know. And uh, maybe we will deconcentrate you, but still I have to ask you something uh, relatively simple, you know. How you feel in this new era of laboratory-grown diamonds? How is going your business now? And how you see the future of laboratory-grown diamonds? Please, Tom. Well, that's a nice, simple question. Um, well, you know, as you've described, my history uh, with my family and my father and, and the work that he started uh, uh, back as a very, very young man a young boy, actually. Uh, he had this passion for chemistry and he followed it throughout his life. Uh, I joined him in 1965 uh, to actually to just get a job. Uh, I did not have his, his intellect. He was definitely a genius. Uh, even with my majors, 
being chemistry and math in college, he just ran circles around me and he hadn't been in school in 30, 40 years. His passion though is his number one passion was creating diamonds. Uh, that's what he wanted to do. He was never successful. Uh, he followed certain rules of chemistry that uh, we have now found are not quite true, and that is the laws of thermodynamics. And I have literally files four inches thick of communications from people over the years trying to get my father to try new approaches to growing diamonds. And if it did not follow the laws of thermodynamics, my father would have nothing to do with it. Of course, CBD has turned that whole thing upside down. Uh, I started with diamond purely by accident. I was in Novosibirsk chasing down some of my emerald competitors in 1993. And that was right after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And there were... Sorry, sorry Tom, is it Tyrus maybe or Tyrus, one of them? Was Tyrus one of them? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, but he was just one of many in Novosibirsk. Uh, Novosibirsk and Minsk, uh, Belarus, Moscow. I mean, they, when the Soviet Union broke up, they left thousands of people in their positions without pay. And we had a lot of very knowledgeable people looking for something to do. And in Novosibirsk, I was taken to this very large uh, research facility that uh, two years prior, I wouldn't even have been allowed into the city, much less this facility. Uh, and I was literally taken from door to door. And this man is making gallium arsenide. Do you have any interest? No, that's already, we do that in the US. We don't need that. Uh, the materials research that was going on in this institution was, was fantastic. One door opened up and there was Dr. Vincent Vins and two PhDs. And he says, I make diamond. Do you have any use for it? I said, yeah, I might have a use for it. And that's what began our research uh, with him, with others in Novosibirsk. I worked in Kiev. I worked in Moscow. I worked in Japan. I, I, the way I operate in general, and, and I think most of the producers will agree with me, and, and in answering your, you know, your problem with getting producers to answer you, there aren't 100 producers of gem quality diamonds in the world. Uh, there are many producers of diamond, but for industrial uses, uh, and they haven't quite gotten over that technological hump or they may not want to. Some people don't want to, and I bumped into that. They said, no, we have a very successful business in abrasives or in this application, that application. We don't know anything about the jewelry industry. And I actually had an invitation from uh, Tracy Hall to join them in Provo, Utah. Uh, and the two sons, David uh, and Tracy Jr., both accomplished chemists and physicists, physicists, uh, but they had no interest in the jewelry industry and the, the, the combination fell apart uh, because of that. So that's what it takes. And so I have that combination of, of a sincere desire to grow crystals uh, of value and to create a business. Uh, and I have the same determination and passion about the jewelry industry and gemology and I really appreciate the work that people like yourself do because they make me look really smart. When we grow a crystal, it's done. After we grow it, you people study it, you write books, I read the book, I give a speech and I sound brilliant. You know. But uh, it's you people that are really doing the work uh, and I appreciate it because it, it is important that there is a separation, there is identification between natural and the laboratory grown, not synthetic, laboratory grown. Uh, it, it, uh, without the natural gemstone, I would be out of business. 
uh, there are things we can do in the laboratory that don't exist and they have no intrinsic value in the, in the gemstone world. So we have never tried to uh, overcome or outshine the natural emerald, ruby, sapphire business or diamond. Uh, I think diamonds got off to a poor start, but uh, you know, just like when Mickey Moto came out with his pearls, it, it, it scared people. Uh, when my father came out, it scared people on Fifth Avenue in New York. We spent a lot of time fighting that fear, and I think we have gotten over that. Uh, same with Ruby and a little bit with Sapphire. But it, it reemerged a thousand percent with the diamond because it is such a big, a big industry. Uh, the fear factor is there. I mean, the first time General Electric made their announcements, uh, I mean, it, the fear factor was there. And it was actually some, well, I'm speculating now, total speculation, some deals made to keep that diamond off the market. Uh, but uh, that's, that's complete hearsay on my part. So we are, we are growing both uh, HPHT and CBD. Uh, and we are making uh, progress as others are. Uh, we don't intentionally change stones to make them harder to identify. We change procedures to make a better stone, a better crystal. And that's a kind of a misconception a lot of people have of crystal growers that we do things to make them harder to identify. It we don't. Uh, we're not. I, I have no of no one that ever did that, including uh, Pierre Gilson and Kashan and some of the others that are no longer around. They were just changing methodologies and technologies. And, and it's, it's a, this is a black art. It doesn't matter what you're growing, emerald, ruby, sapphire, diamond. It is a black art and there are no rule books. Uh, there's nowhere to learn to grow these gemstones. And none of us share the information between each other, even though I reach out immediately when I find a new producer and at least try to become professional acquaintances so we can work from a, a common ground. Perhaps I can help them avoid embarrassments or misseps like uh, the eco-friendly aspects of uh, laboratory grown diamonds. I mean, it, yes, you could argue that, but I agree with the FTC. If you can't back it up, you can't say it. Uh, so I advise people say, you know, just just back up on that particular area and try and just sell your product for what it is. It is a diamond. A diamond is a diamond. You must identify it as such from the lab and sell it on its marriage. You can get it less expensively. You can get a larger stone. You can get a color that's unachievable or, or impossible to buy. Uh, collector's pieces, what have you. And, and, and I think we're sliding into that area now of, uh, of selling our products on their merit in the gemstone world, not us versus them. Uh, and hopefully we'll stop throwing rocks at each other. Uh, Tom, before you, I have one question from uh, uh, one attendees. I'll ask in a second. I'll ask, because the slide is now about color diamonds, and this is big... Uh, research area for Dushan and me and the beginning we see on the left what you uh, produced 2004 on the right is what Swarovski put now uh, uh, the distributor of, uh, of diamonds I was in their factory uh, sorry at their uh, place where they're in Austria and they are doing this uh, on the top of the diamond uh, less inscription and the question for you uh, what colors do you produce now and uh, and now you're doing CVD. Do you have also a variety of stones similar to uh, what is on the right? Or, and the uh, mm -hmm. question is uh, for CVD uh, uh, colors, uh, what is uh, what you are making now? And I know it's difficult to predict the color. We know this uh, as the researchers. Somebody cannot just order, I want a uh, fancy intense blue VVS. Uh, you have to make it. And then, so what is your, uh, 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 what can you tell us about this uh, color diamond that you're making? And uh, 
in ratio of as grown, because some of these stones are as grown, some of them are post-treated to create these colors, different colors. Uh, what you would uh, do price-wise, uh, a stone is just uh, as grown, for example, uh, JK color uh, CVD, and if it's uh, post-treated to uh, EF, uh, uh, whatever, what, what you would do with regarding pricing, my question for you to start with? Well, first of all, growing color diamonds was the easiest to do if you could grow diamonds at all. And that's why we saw so many yellows coming out of Gemesis uh, and other places. So due to the presence of nitrogen, which is very abundant in the atmosphere, that caused yellow stones to grow. And it took a lot of years to figure out what element will go after that nitrogen and leave the stone colorless. During that period of, of growing colored diamonds, we did branch out as we learned to reduce the nitrogen in the stone. We also learned how to irradiate permanently stones to get pink. And of course, throwing a little boron in through grew the, the blues. The problem we ran into, and which is why we don't produce colored diamonds today, is on your screenshot here, there is one color pink and one color blue that people want. And it's impossible to dial that in. And I still have thousands of stones that aren't quite the right color. So we moved as we progressed in our technology into growing white only. And uh, by both methods. And uh, that is, of course, the biggest market in the diamond industry. Never mind the million dollar carat pinks you see on Sotheby's, that's a different world. Uh, our world is, is the, the bread and butter of the jewelry industry, and uh, we have to keep our, our mind and, and our attention uh, on that. And so we, at, um, as soon as we could, we moved into the whites. Uh, in regards to the question of growing uh, lesser colors in either process and treating it, I personally don't think it makes any difference, as long as it's permanent, that the stone has been treated to create that color because I think the biggest treatment is in actually growing the crystal. So it's little things that we do after the fact if they're permanent, I don't think uh, affect the value of the stone. That's my personal opinion. I would, I would, uh, I would ask uh, 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 right now. Um, uh, I think uh, we are agree that natural diamond and the laboratory grown diamonds they are two different products, right, Tom? Yes. You are you are agree with this, you know. Just that my question right now will be: What do you think about standardization in production of uh, laboratory grown diamonds? For example, that uh, by some rules, by some standards, uh, FTC will say: Okay, every laboratory grown diamonds must have just three hundred to 500 parts per million of nitrogen and could be HPN treated, but not longer than for three minutes. Just a... What do I think of that? Give me your, yeah, what you think about this? Well, yeah, i tell you what. Uh, in many presentations, I am asked, why don't we put a dopant in our crystals so they could easily be identified uh, this was asked especially after the introduction of the flux ruby and the treatments that were being done to natural ruby that mimicked our inclusions. Uh, the Monsu ruby is uh, famous for that. I have, I have misidentified Monsu rubies as mine and even challenged the GIA on it because I thought they made a mistake. And so as a professional courtesy, I sent it back to Vince Manson. I said, Vince, look at this stone. I don't think it's natural. It's mine. And I don't like to see anybody embarrassed that way. And uh, they 
got the stone. They looked at it, looked at it, did every test imaginable. They said, it's natural. This is what happens when you heat treat a Mansu ruby. The fluxes, what have you, that are, uh, that are, that are in the stone, uh, the materials in the stone, they react in such a way as they create these, these types of inclusions. So for the, uh, first of all, the FTC is not going to, they don't work that way. Uh, but I understand that the, the nature of the question, if some body came by, uh, the things that I said in presentations was that, listen, there are only what five of us in the world that know how to do this. And now you want to change the basic formula for growing the crystal? You want to tell me how to do that? You know how hard this is? You start throwing in trace yeah. elements or, or controlling parts per million of, of nitrogen. You're talking about a whole new research project that can take lifetimes to accomplish. So, I, it's I, I'm I'm not against the idea. I just think it uh, is undoable. Uh, it's not practical. Yeah, no, for now. Okay. For now. For <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I've been at this 50 years. There've been a lot of things that are not practical that I don't do. But you know, uh, you know uh, uh, about my. Patent. What is a what is idea? Idea is that uh, uh, it is possible. I did it by myself, you know. Even uh, with the diamonds, they are not uh, standardized, you know. That uh, it is possible to uh, to create the damage envy centers uh, to that will give uh, pink fluorescence without uh, changing a color. The H color will stay H color, and the diamond will be will show uh, pink fluorescence. Is so, this an, uh, an after treatment? Yeah, this okay. is after after grow after grow treatment, and after H P H D treatment, it is also possible to do this with with H P H D grown and with C V D grown. You know, this is what. Uh, what the patent is about, you know. So it means it will, it will prevent many problems if we would have this. It will, it will also make the the, the price of the of the uh, laboratory grown diamonds uh, cheaper or better uh, for producers, you know. And uh, yeah, this is what I wanted to say. No, I, I appreciate the, the thought. I, I tell you, I actually had another idea that I presented to De Beers when they invented that hologram that they put under the surface of the stone uh, to identify their stone. Yes, I am aware of this. And I offered them my wholehearted support, uh, 100% support, in getting all producers to use this technology if they would supply it. They weren't interested. But to do you know yeah. why, Tom? Because, because it is too expensive. For example, the, the system to create uh, NV centers is uh, like a cost of one dollar per, per car. Cost nothing. Uh, and also, you can you can check identify the bulk of the diamonds. You don't need to to watch uh, one by one. Dushan, uh, what was addressed? Uh, you'll talk about this on December six in detail. Yeah, we have, just, uh, we have already a uh, lot of questions. And uh -huh. but but it's uh, interesting uh, why? Because people now are talking about uh, theoretically without slides. So uh, we have three four slides, uh, not more, uh, about your uh, first uh, research on. Uh, small uh, color diamonds and you can show how pink diamonds fluoresce uh, uh, when they have enemy centers because some of them are pink in this original uh, chat and pink just to show the color and if you don't just uh, guide us with this at least four slides then i have at least uh, five questions uh, six for tom from the our attendees okay let's quickly go to the slides explain what you did uh, at the conference in bangkok uh, 2006. Uh, all, already i said you know it was a uh, we were, we found uh, in in this ring uh, one stone was was a, a laboratory grown, and uh, I mean 
like uh, this is the first one, it identified laboratory-grown diamonds in jewelry, you know. It was in two, 2006, you know. I forgot which one it is, but yeah. it, it is one very yeah. simple to identify, you know. It was with the, with the, with the fluorescence and the cubic form. And for those who don't know, uh, Dushan also is a he was a jeweler in Serbia, and he knows how to set uh, jewelry. This is a stone from Tom Chatham, and Dushan, can you explain what you did with these stones, how we create these uh, little pieces yeah. of imitation? They are stones w w what we bought, uh, uh, bought from, from you in order to, to make this uh, experiment and to develop a system for identification. And uh, so here are three different metals. So uh, we, we identify this on two ways. One is a fluorescence. And the second one is with the, with the hemistry. Just, uh, just uh, this is fluorescence. I could, it is all, all already very known, you know, how it works. Almost all black boxes are working uh, following this method. And the but second do, one is... What's important uh, for those, you mentioned a patent. This is how it will look uh, more, very close to this uh, color of diamonds under a long UV light when they have envy centers with the nitrogen vacancy center induced, correct? This is envy, envy, this is type of fluorescence you're talking about, orange. Yeah, but here, here, here the original color is changed. Yeah, but, but that's, that's about fluorescence, generally. And the second one, the se second method is uh, like a hemistry in order to uh, to 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 follow catalyst uh, in uh, in uh, uh, HPNC grown diamonds uh, like uh, 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 iron and cobalt, and the blue 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 graph is a background. Actually, this is a metal, and the red one. Is is a stone where we ob obviously see cobalt and uh, iron as a as a proof that the stone is uh, laboratory grown. Okay, so now I will keep this slide for some time because uh, for those who can repeat these years on the bottom of a very very short Tom Chatham bio because it was very long. I had to make it very short because he is <laughs> over fifty years in industry like a. When I was born, he started. So, uh, I have a question, uh, Tom, for you. Uh, whoever uh, put a name, I will read the name. So, if you don't want to be an anonymous, you can you can you can uh, r remove your name. Uh, so, from Gina Barreto, Tom, from one to ten, how you would rate the env environmental commitment of the lab-grown diamond industry? What they should do in order to improve this topic? Do you think it's fair to say that? Synthetic diamonds take more care of the environment in comparison with natural diamonds. Thanks. Well, first of all, yeah, there is no product made that does not affect the environment in some way, in some little way. I mean, the carbon comes from somewhere. The other elements we use come from somewhere. They're, you know, resourced from the earth, the steel, the, you know, all of those things do affect the the, the earth. Uh, we don't dig huge holes in the ground uh, and leave them like uh, the natural people do. Uh, we don't contaminate uh, water sources. Uh, we have strict rules and regulations in regards to anything that comes out of uh, one of our furnaces. Uh, it's been in existence for a long time, but uh, I, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a to me it's a non-issue for laboratory-grown diamonds to even mention the uh, uh, environmentally uh, uh, effect, environmental effect they may have, because it's 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 a to me a distant second. Uh, as far as importance, the important thing is, is it's a diamond and uh, it's less expensive and it's bigger. So that's my opinion on the environmental issue. Okay, thank you, Tom. And uh, basically two questions from two people, but uh, similar, uh, so I will bind them together. Uh, from Snate uh, in Canada and Jonathan in USA. Uh, what is the highest color grade of CVDs and what color grade whites are you producing via CVD? 
Oh, color grades. Well, we're we're in the D's. You know, D color uh, in both both processes. Uh, so uh, we get lesser, of course. Uh, we don't get down into the J's as before in uh, CBD. Uh, everybody is constantly researching this. You know, the, the, these aren't new processes either. CBD has been around longer than HPHD. Uh, people just aren't, weren't aware of it, and people like myself didn't apply themselves to it. But uh, it, it, there's, there's breakthroughs. Well, it's been amazing how many breakthroughs there have been because it, it took, oh, 20, 30 years for somebody else to grow an, an emerald. That was Pierre Gilson uh, after my father. And then after I joined him and we grew Ruby, it only took another 10 years. So it's, I forget who's uh, the famous quote that uh, things are leapfrogging in, in development, doubling every year. Uh, in, uh, you know, chips, uh, components, and their ability to, to uh, handle information is doubling and tripling every year. Uh, and that's sort of what's happening in crystal growth. Uh, even though we don't share the information, uh, you know, we look at each other's stones for sure. And uh, uh, it, it, it's getting better and better. So there are at least a dozen of us around the world that can grow D color, uh, no problem. Okay, thank you. And there is a basically two or three uh, questions related to certification. One is sexy to me, one is a Q&A, &A, uh, but I'll read uh, hopefully some time left and right. So uh, about certification uh, from Jonathan, uh, he agreed that has grown CVD versus HPHT treated and this is also a question for you if I assume most of your D's are HPHT enhanced not as grown without treatment from certification standpoint uh, Jonathan thinks that uh, uh, e-color HPHT treated should be uh, have different uh, level of uh, acknowledgement or because it requires more skill to produce DEF color so the, ignoring financial implication and also uh, I think Antoinette mentioning about the rarity uh, in uh, certain colors and uh, what quality reports would uh, reflect uh, in case of grown uh, basically it's about pricing as well is it uh, a relation of basically of pricing structure and rarity uh, because as you know it's not the same as natural diamonds uh, uh, rarity. I mean, you don't produce or you, you won't put on the market uh, 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 ST or uh, light brown uh, diamond. You would make them differently. So, the, to conclude this, uh, would be the major difference in case natural occurring diamonds, uh, this uh, uh, arbitrary pricing structure and rarity issue. Uh, can you re reflect on the rarity of the lab grown diamonds compared to natural and how they should be graded, basically? As you know, GA now started to grade them uh, the same scale. This is new press release. And uh, Dushan Simic replied, uh, uh, and we, because we, we don't talk about this in this book, but maybe it will be mentioned next year, uh, what we think, uh, what Dushan thinks about grading of laboratory grown diamonds. This is another topic, grading of these diamonds. Yeah, I've never been a, a proponent of uh, certification or grading of uh, laboratory grown diamonds. Uh, I remember talking to Ralph Destino. Uh, the GIA about this very subject when he was uh, proudly introducing this new uh, certificate they were going to uh, use at the GIA to grade laboratory grown diamonds and I said we don't we don't trade paper and that is what your certificates have turned into whether you like it or not and I think they would be hard put to disagree with that. I mean, that's what they're doing. Uh, and people like Martin Rappaport have, have uh, furthered that concept of trading paper. And it is, it, it is a good way to communicate information about a product without shipping it. I agree with that 100%. But 
you know, I, we do it now. We grade our stones, and, and the people that work for me are all GI graduates, some of them are ex GIA diamond graders. Uh, so we know what we're doing. Uh, the GIA certificate is expensive, uh, and it's probably the most expensive in the world. Uh, so we don't use it, the primary for that reason. I don't, I don't personally believe in grading and, and uh, lasering of uh, girdles to identify a stone. And I've said this publicly a couple of times. What I believe in is people know their gemology to identify a diamond or stay out of the business. And that's what I don't like is when somebody says, I got taken in Bogota with one of your stones. And I've had somebody say that to me in my office. I lost $50,000 because of you. And I said, what business are you in? He said, well, I'm a pilot. I said, I don't fly planes. You don't buy gemstones. <laughs> So it's a very good answer. <laughs> you know, and he was ready to kill me. And I said, you just, you shouldn't be in this business. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, we take a lot for granted. I mean, we're around gemstones. We were around gemology and you guys have done a great job in simplifying it. Uh, and I think that's good. But uh, as far as certificates and, and lasering, uh, I consider it, a false crutch, it's too easy to cheat. And like you mentioned in the introduction, uh, you can take a natural 2A uh, stone, get it certed, and then since all of ours are all 2A, you could copy it. It's a little hard to do, but uh, I, I'm sure it could be done. Uh, it, it would take, a, you know, people would say, well, who would spend months doing that? Well, if you're talking about Twenty, thirty thousand dollars. I spend months on it. Uh, I think we've all seen some great uh, fake stones created in the industry or yeah, in the industry worldwide over the years. Uh, when there's a will, there's a way to do it. But uh, so the certificates are, are not, in a nutshell, important to us. Uh, it's a means of communication. Uh, we use our own certificates, and we grade with the same standards that GI does. And, and I, I've got to mention, because my friend uh, Robert James has brought it up a few times, is none of the grading standards will stand up in a court of law. There's nobody says that this is the way to do it. So what good is it? And so it's a means of communication. That's, that's it, in my opinion. A very interesting uh, standpoint, and uh, I know you're a big promoter of education, and this is uh, just coming to this webinar, this is your proving that you want to share information and educate people. And I know I am uh, over the last 15 years in my workshops and, uh, and the lectures and Dushan as well. So we do think uh, books like this are necessary uh, to promote uh, knowledge, information. Uh, but what is scary for me, and we know this, me and Dushan, but we really think this should be uh, every jeweler, retailer should have this book as well, not only uh, appraiser or gemologist, because they have to understand how to detect on their level of standard instrument at least. But yesterday I have a wholesaler, one of the biggest wholesalers in Vancouver, and the biggest retailer, both of them came to visit my laboratory, and I have behind me uh, six or seven instruments from the $300 to the $30,000, and I try to explain them because they want to see the laboratory, they're not interested because they, they, they don't want to learn. They just like to buy black boxes and just put them a machine. Why I'm talking about this? Because there's one question uh, in the beginning that I, I will come back to this because I like to answer all questions, even uh, from Antonat Metlins. If I'm familiar, I, I guess, uh, not a question for you, Tom, but I want to cover this uh, knowledge and education component. Am I familiar with the Ari Coralless Diamond Tester? This is the box uh, Ari uh, is from Presidium. Just came to me two weeks ago uh, because uh, I do a lot of instruments. I'm telling the website, so they ask me what they think about their uh, their instrument. Uh, to answer to to Antoinette and other people, uh, it is a screener. I did not test it on my 55 samples like other seven instruments. And those who attended my webinar in spring, it 
I have this analysis of seven instruments, including GIA, Diamond Check, and uh, that I, I don't owe, and uh, and uh, from uh, Yahoo, uh, not Yehuda, from uh, uh, a company from uh, I'll remember from Israel. Uh, so the thing is, it is a screener uh, uh, for those who don't want to know. It is a good screener, but not final identification. Why? Because still your Type Two A natural diamond would refer as type 2a it won't tell you if natural type 2a or or lab grown type 2a it will just screen all these unusual rare uh, types uh, based on i assume uh, uv transparency uh. so uh, this is my answer i did not check it yet on all samples because busy with these two webinars uh, but the next week i will do this and who comes to the webinar in uh, October, no, december 18 I'll be talking about this more in detail uh, of findings. There's also an instrument uh, from John Chapman in Australia. It's a mini basic spectrometer. There's also an instrument that Dushan is working with. Uh, hopefully next year we'll be on the market. Uh, we will see uh, how far, how fast it could be done. The basically spectroscopy is the key and final answer, but all the rest is like a screening instrument. So this is my opinion on this instrument identification. Uh, it's good if you don't have I will, anything. I will just uh, add something, you know, that none of this instruments respect uh, the basic rules that we have in our labs. Uh, we have to make the final de decision by using at least two different methods. And only if you are following this rule, you can solve the problem. But, okay, this is a long story. Yeah. Perhaps we will, we will continue yeah. with this. So, those are uh, hard, hardcore gemologists. So please come back in December <laughs> or Dushan and Mines. We put ourselves at the end because it's really you have to listen to this for one hour for me and Dushan and you will learn a lot and we'll show instruments. I have on the back another five instruments that I will show and Dushan has his. So the uh, thing is, uh, yes, uh, that's why even now when I'm selling these uh, portable instruments, uh, I I'm not saying it's better than nothing. I mean, uh, Presidium, uh, this one, old model, is better than nothing. A lot of people are buying it, but I would never recommend to buy only one instrument, as Dushan said. I, I, I now offering this combo. Mm -hmm. Buy UV good uh, PL inspector or UV lamp in combination with the uh, Presidium. Don't just buy one instrument because you will be stuck and you will be give wrong information to your staff and to your client and you will make wrong identification uh, in, because many of them are, are not... Uh, uh, 100%, actually, none of them is single, 100%. 90, 95, it, it's a good instrument if you can do that much. Well, just think so, of it, the, the colored stone industry does not use one instrument to identify yeah. a stone. Correct, correct. It's a series of tests. Yeah, you're right, you're right. I mean, so, uh, it has to be uh, microscopy, fluorescence, and uh, other tests, uh, what is fluorescence spectroscopy. Uh, three, at least, uh, the best. Okay, so we'll talk about this uh, uh, next. Uh, can, can I answer and you asked me a question, though, and, and I think it, it's, it's worthy of an answer when you held up the book. I think the book is extremely important. Uh, it, 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 it pulls together a lot of the information and uh, the years of work that you and other people like uh, Antoinette Matlins has done. Uh, it, uh, it, it's very important. Yes. And, I mean, and this is not, I don't get a part of the, <laughs> the royalty. Antoinette, Antoinette reviewed the book. Uh, uh, she has her own books, but uh, she was definitely helped. Uh, she gave a great review that we will show in a few seconds. Uh, actually, I, I will mention two, two uh, at least two questions from Antoinette, uh, because it is part of this book. That's why we mentioned it as a history. Uh, can you comment on the impact of Robert Zilnare's introduction of Coral City Diamond, talking about Apollo? I met in 2001 at the, at the International uh, Diamond Conference in Budapest uh, as a producer. I didn't know who they are. 2000, 2003, they brought the stones to the laboratory. Uh, myself and Dushan at that time, uh, I left to Canada. We started studied them, published in 2004, first, I think, first in industry in uh, 2003, actually, in uh, the News Asia, and then in the BIRS Conference and, uh, and our own uh, publication. So what is the Apollo Im impact on CVD, in your opinion, to answer this question from Antoinette? What was their impact? Yes. Well, they, uh, Robert Lanier's, who actually worked with my father on a few projects, uh, he was on the right track and uh, spent an incredible amount of money, as many people have, 
uh, trying to grow diamond. As a matter of fact, I interject a little book uh, idea. Uh, Robert Hazen has written a book, not recently, it's, it's quite old, called The Diamond Makers. And it's a, a fascinating tale of 250 years of people trying to grow diamond. Uh, and the different ways it's done and a number of people that were killed in their in their attempts to grow diamond. Um, Robert ran out of money and uh, kept doing something that I abhor in the crystal growing arena is that you keep doing the same thing the same way, you will get the same mistakes again and again and again. Uh, I've had, I've worked with huge firms that just don't understand that concept. We, even to this day, make changes in our emerald production, little changes. And we do it in such a way that we can see if we've helped it, we've heard it, we haven't affected it. Uh, it, it research is constantly going on. And unfortunately, it causes problems sometimes for gemologists uh, because we in a, unintentionally create differences in the in the end product but uh so robert lanier's work uh went to um oh, i forget the name of the company uh i know you all know it out there i think it's in the carolinas uh and it doesn't matter because it failed too and they hadn't they hadn't got the concept of power of uh the uh, plasma power needed to uh, do what you need to do. Uh, I'm not going to get into the technical parts of that, but it, something that people don't often talk about is that how how you make a diamond in these instruments or in the in the instrumentation is not easy, and there's no there's no rule book as I said, on formulas, and there's no rule book on how to build a machine. So we are all experimenting constantly, if, uh, if you want to stay in business, to uh, get over this, you know, this knowledge hump. So uh, Lanier's was the first. Uh, we worked with Bob for a number of years trying to get him to get it out. And I worked with... Uh, Carter Clark at Genesis, and I told him to quit building machines and get more on research instead of building 200 presses that produce 200 junky crystals. Um, so it, it's, I don't know if, I, if I'm answering your question about Bob Lanier's and, and Apollo, but the, I would say they just, like Genesis, ran out of money. Yeah, okay. So I just put this slide uh, as your last slide about your stones because it's a question about that and you can tell it's really a great picture because saying that these stones are between a uh, third of the carat to one and a half. This is uh, from cover of the book, Your Stones. And Thank we'll, you. start, we'll put them more in the next book that will be a technical book for next year, more about from different perspective for those hardcore gemologists who has instruments on spectroscopy and the more... Uh, science but this is for next year so the question is uh, are the higher colors df in large sizes over one kilo and half or only in smaller stones talking about df color i guess uh, cvd and hpht your stones <laughs> to make over one kilo and half in these colors i know they're on the market i've seen many bigger stones yes so i've seen 10 carat uh, uh, 10 carat vvs 2 e i've tested it published it so this is just to basically close the questions with you and then, uh, because we have one hour and 10 minutes, I know we can talk another hour for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. People told me my webinars are too long, but we can go another five, 10 minutes, maybe maximum. Yeah, we know we've grown larger white stones. Uh, in my discussions with uh, Tamazi of uh, New Diamond Technology in St. Petersburg, uh, trying to grow the largest stone, you know, on record, I said, yeah. Tamazi, why are you doing this? You know, a hundred carat piece of rough that looks pretty bad i have a picture i didn't want to show it but i'll show it in my presentation a yeah. 120 carat uh, uh, yellow diamond crystal yeah they grow yeah. it but uh and i gotta take my hats off to them i mean they are the best crystal grower i think today 
uh, in the world. I don't know about De Beers. They don't like to talk about anything, but they're good crystal growers too, of course. But uh, yeah, new diamond technology produces some beautiful rough. Uh, and they have made breakthroughs uh, that I think I'm second guessing on now, but that's not for public dissemination. Thank you a lot, uh, Tom, uh, for your really uh, great insight. I know you can talk much more, but hopefully we'll see you again in San Francisco or like I did last January over some dinner or, or cocktail in the bar and we talk more about our industry, the future. Uh, future is what will come. We predicted this uh, kind of in 2007. Uh, I repeat this and then basically uh, I will uh, allow the, for a second uh, for Antoinette, if she wants to say something, uh, she's there. To talk, uh, and uh, basically we said uh, we want to see Lego diamond industry that was 13 years ago and 15 as a unique part of our industry, not as a threat. And I even did interview now for Raffin Polish magazine in Dushan. It's not a threat. It's a different product. It's a good product if you disclose what it is. People has a budget uh, to buy it uh, and they like it. Uh, why to fight it? You know, this is my opinion. And uh, actually, Antoinette uh, and Richard. Uh, Drucker and Stuart Robertson gave us uh, this nice review uh, of uh, here Antoinette uh, joining us just for a second. And basically for those who don't have our book, and I know half of you have my books because you're, you're big fans. Believe it or not, people uh, emailed me this morning, sorry, Branko, yesterday I was up to one o'clock in the night in Sydney and Mel uh, uh, Brisbane waiting for the webinar. And sorry, I cannot be another night. So this is a commitment to education from some people in Australia, really. Uh, I put my head down uh, to Australians and, and British and Americans as well. They are big, big uh, uh, fan base in these three countries, of course, Europe. I have people from India, China. Uh, thank you, uh, first, uh, uh, Dushan, for uh, staying uh, two times in, in a row, and uh, Tom uh, with me and with other people for coming to be part of this webinar. I, I hope we put some lights to the topic of uh, a present, future, and uh, uh, past of the Lego diamond industry. And because it's Halloween, uh, this is what comes sometimes to my laboratory. So it is not always scientific, but sometimes it's fun. This is just from one uh, local uh, person who likes this kind of uh, stuff. This is uh, all uh, now for gemologists is interesting. Uh, you can see on the left, uh, long UV light, on the right, short UV light uh, under Jewelry Inspector uh, that, that I'm uh, using here. Because easy to make a picture. There's a program from Gemetrix to make pictures easy to save. You can see how all these blue colors, on the long UV as medium, non or weak or medium and strong blue. Under short UV light, they're one, two degrees uh, weaker. This is natural diamonds, natural color, unless they're unlikely uh, coated or, or, or credit enhanced. And you can see how big are these uh, fluorescence eyes of this stone. The other piece is a black diamond. Uh, they are treated, they're not natural color, as, as, as well as uh, small diamonds uh, uh, at the mouth. And all these diamonds the fluoresce these interesting, strange colors, like scary colors. They're basically uh, basically treated uh, uh, yellow to orange uh, uh, diamond. So this is just something. There are no synthetics here, but just to show you uh, one Halloween, uh, the last uh, slide. So thank you, Tom, and enjoy your. Uh, hopefully, you will come back uh, uh, to webinars. But uh, you didn't tell us uh, just about your fishing. Uh, did you uh, did you catch something uh, uh, big or just small fish, like a small diamond? Or yeah, I caught a small diamond. Uh... <laughs> This is the biggest fishing tournament in the world uh, called the Bisbee Black and Blue Marlin Fishing Tournament. First prize is $4.6 million U.S. Wow. Uh, the minimum size fish is 300 pounds, and no one caught a fish that big, which is very <laughs> unusual. We won uh, in one category of catch and release smaller marlin, and that put us in third place and we were one out of three boats that got money out of 127 boats so we, we feel good about that but it wasn't in the millions <laughs> i i told tom uh, uh, at our practice that once we sell uh, 3000 of these books uh, we will join a little boat me and dushan uh, fishing in uh, by california uh, next year okay we have a one year to sell it and then we are joining you okay yeah and i, I, I won't tell I won't be back in the U.S. until uh, December, okay. so I, I won't have a chance to review the book, but I will as soon as I get back. No problem, no problem. Uh, uh, have a good uh, trip back, and uh, uh, all the best uh, for you who are waiting, uh, who come back. Don't worry for those. 
I mean, a few of them uh, could not uh, join us again. Uh, yesterday, it was really a big, big problem with my computer. So it, it's, uh, but anyway, uh, we'll record this, put on our website, brancogem.com under practical webinars. And we're now thinking to put it also on YouTube uh, to make it uh, uh, easier for uh, for people to to uh, uh, look without uh, having to leave their information. So we're doing everything what we can to educate and bring some joy and some uh, knowledge and some information to the industry. Uh, the more things uh, we plan to publish, uh, more articles, more information. So, Dushan, until next time. Uh, I guess in one week or less from now, I'll be talking to Frank Ripka and then in two weeks uh, with Boris Figlesson and then Sherry Woodring. And then uh, every week or two, we'll have these webinars until we cover uh, the book completely. Great. All the best. Thank you to all guests. Thank you to guests uh, for Thank coming you, in, in, in the numbers and uh, Thank you for having me. staying uh, until the end. Oh, yeah. All the best. Bye bye. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye.